Good afternoon. Uh, welcome once again to Red Hat Summit. Um, we're going to spend the next hour talking about um, Exascale Active Archives and uh, Object Storage with Red Hat Ceph Storage. My name is Steve Bohack. I work in the storage BU here uh, at Red Hat focused on uh, Object Storage and Ceph. And my colleague, Neil. Introduce Hi, you. I'm Neil Levine, Director of Product Management for uh, Red Hat Ceph Storage in the storage BU. Just before we begin, just curious, just a show of hands, uh, who is uh, either running, either in production or even in your lab testing out Ceph storage, either community or Red Hat's distribution? Okay, then the same question for Gluster as well. Okay, just, I was just curious on that one. Okay, so you guys pretty much um, somewhat familiar with the products and software-defined storage. We're not gonna spend too much time with that. But basically, we'll just talk a little bit about object storage, what it is, its emergence as a storage architecture over the last couple of years and its kind of acceleration, what active archives are, um, some of the Ceph best practices for those kind of uh, installations, as well as the Ceph roadmap that's catering towards object storage, which would be uh, a good choice for active archives. And then we'll just wrap it up and leave some time for questions at the end. So again, thanks for the show of hands. Obviously, everybody in the room is pretty familiar with software-defined storage. We're not going to spend too much really time talking about it. The, the couple of key things I did want to highlight based on this slide is the kind of growing uh, amount of uh, folks and customers such as yourselves that are adopting it. It's been accelerating over the last couple of years, and as you can see by the chart, continues to, or is expected, I should say, to continue into the future. Um, one thing I did want to um, highlight on the chart, let me move over to this side, is it's probably kind of hard to see all the different colors, but they're, it's supposed to break down the types of the data that software-defined storage will address over time. It's, you might be able to see the green portion of the bar. Uh, that's the, the analyst expectations of what object storage is going to be as a percentage of software-defined storage. So object storage has its uh, definite place in the software-defined storage market. Uh, as a matter of fact, according to some industry statistics, 70% uh, will be used um, uh, this from for software defined storage seventy percent will be used for um, uh, as software only versions from the customers uh, from the vendors and then of course most of this stuff is going to be uh, targeted at or used for unstructured data and uh, it's also anticipated in the next four years seventy to eighty percent of unstructured data will be held on software defined storage kind of products so uh, we'll be t obviously talking mostly about object, or excuse me, on structured data, which uh, covers this market, and that that is uh, continue to grow from the industry analyst perspective. If you look at the workloads, what's there today with software-defined storage? What's expected to be over the next couple of years? A couple of years, obviously, cloud is one of the big enablers and has been over the last couple of years. But object storage is also there today. Uh, today, we are beginning to talk more and more about that with Ceph. I think in general, if any of you saw the announcement last week of Red Hat Ceph Storage 2.0, you'll begin to see us talk more about its object capabilities. Now, in, in terms of Ceph, that's not nothing new. It's been an object store from the beginning, but you'll at least see Red Hat talking more about that into the. Uh, to the future. So that's definitely a, a, a use case today. In the emerging space, uh, maybe some of you are already starting to look at this, more and more people are. It's certainly not in, not in production yet, per se, really. Are the analytics, hyperconvergence, and containers. All of those are also getting their kind of airtime today in some of the different sessions. So it's definitely, we, we view it as an emerging space. But really, the here and now with today is cloud and object. And beyond that, you know, three to five years, it'd be interesting to see where things go. But that's kind of our view on kind of where things are near term and into the short term future. So even before I uh, will explain this slide or talk about this slide, who is, who is familiar with object storage and what it is, what it means? Pretty much mostly, yeah. So uh, I'm not going to spend too much time on this, on this slide, but basically, you know, as you all know, its object is defined as a certain piece of data and all of its associated metadata that goes with that data. Typically, that's going to be a file. Uh, if, if you look at if you look at industry forecasts, they tend to lump where files storage is going with object because there's a lot of overlap there because it does typically tend to be a file. And a lot of today's file installations, if they grow larger and larger, may become object installations later on in its kind of next iteration. So they're very uh, interrelated. However, there are, of course, some very key differences. Uh, that, that is what an object is by its definition, but its organizational model is a lot different than a file system. As a matter of fact, that's one of its main values as a storage architecture is the lack of that hierarchical file uh, system. 
Now, not to say there's anything wrong with that. That was a great model. But what happens with those systems, as I'm sure most of you know, is as they get bigger and bigger, either in terms of the amount of capacity under management or the number of files under management. And when I say bigger and bigger, I'm talking about you know in the range of a million files or above, or a petabyte kind of capacity under management, give or take, and above. Uh, that's where those file-based architectures really start to kind of show some limitations. Performance is probably going to slow down, and some of it's uh, inherent. Um, gaps, I guess I would say, are exposed at that kind of scale. So more and more people, when they get up into those larger installations, are really beginning to look at object, and that's, I'm guessing, probably maybe things you're considering uh, as well. So that's one of its key differences is that, you know, the, the, the flatter organizational structure. The other key difference, of course, is that metadata itself. There's a lot of value in that metadata, as we'll, we'll talk about uh, in today's session. I think one of the key things you'll see is how that, that metadata um, provides value in an active archive and just kind of in general what different things uh, folks can do with it. Um, and then, of course, uh, yeah, it tends to be groups and pools, and the object uh, themselves are accessed by the specific object ID of the object. And as I said, it's really all about the metadata and that flat organizational structure in terms of the value that object storage has. Um, again, probably most of you know this, but you know, Object is in uh, substantial use today by many big name companies. We're all familiar with that. We probably even use on a day-to-day -day -day basis, whether we're posting uh, whatever uh, files or presentations on LinkedIn to our professional network, or even to our friends and family on Facebook, streaming music on Spotify, um, things like that. Those are all based on Object architectures, and that's all publicly you know, stated. I'm not really giving away the farm or anything. That's, that's, that's how those companies did it. And it's the, a lot of the reasons they went to those approaches were kind of the things I was talking about earlier. Uh, the kind of scale that they need, you know, a file-based system is just going to um, really not meet their needs. A, a couple of links I just threw in here is one is the uh, blog from uh, LinkedIn actually about their use of object. They've actually open sourced some of the things they've been doing on their object um, uh, architecture. It's a, pretty, it's a pretty long entry. It's pretty interesting, though. One of the things that I found uh, kind of staggering is they were mentioning that the reason they went to Object is because they needed to have the ability to manage, uh, was it trillions of small object sizes and billions of large object sizes. So that's just kind of mind blowing the kind of scale that they're looking at and you know want to be able to enable into the future. Uh, Yahoo very much, obviously you would imagine similar kind of web scale kind of size, very similar points there. But uh, definitely interesting reading and this is definitely that's, that's out there now on the web. Um, the other thing I would say on this slide too is it's not just about web um, kind of based companies too. Enterprises more and more are looking at this as well. They're kind of learning from some of these things that the web based companies are doing and now it really is beginning to get into the enterprise. Okay, kind of a conceptual graph. This is not, not a, a hard and firm data kind of data kind of graph. But really, what I, what I want to begin to talk about a little bit here now is kind of the rise of active archives and why that has come over the last I don't know five or so years. Um, basically, you know, probably what we've seen and what we've heard is that you know your capacity needs continue to grow year over year. Maybe it's even more aggressive than you were expecting or forecasted. But the reality is that it's growing and it's it's expected to continue to grow pretty aggressively over the next few years. Whereas at the same time, though, the dollar per gigabyte that you're buying your storage at, really whatever type of media storage that is, even flash that applies to today, uh, is, is going you know, further and further down. So you're, you're beginning to be a lot more maybe aggressive in the types of uh, things you're going to do with the different media types. It's not necessarily the same kind of strict bounded tier one, tier two, tier three type uh, organizations. There's beginning to be some blending across those models. And that's kind of where the, the active archives have begun to kind of come to the fore. And this is just one of the big things that kind of led, led people to begin to think about blending those boundaries. It's not just necessarily so flash-based, you know, maybe SAS or SATA, and then pure SATA and tape for the third tier. There's some blending there. Yeah, so then that brings to the next slide. So how do we, what is an active archive? How do we define uh, what an active archive is? We kind of see really four main points. The, this first one is beginning to touch on what I was talking about a minute ago, which is kind of the um, uh, elimination of kind of that hard boundary between maybe your, your classic archive and more your cold backup kind of data. Now you want things a little more um, uh, faster, ex faster accessibly, or accessibly faster, maybe that's, you want to be able to access it faster, is what I'm trying to say. Uh, you don't want to have to wait a couple days to dig out that tape and get at that file for whatever reasons, compliance reasons, whatever reason you have to maybe access it. Uh, you really want to, certainly want to continue to always retain it, but you, now you want a higher uh, requirement to really have that online now. So that's one key thing. 
Um, the ability that you're going to write it once, as I mentioned, kind of read it infrequently, and it's never going to be modified. But you still want to read that infrequently, and when you do, you, want, you don't want to wait a couple days or even a week to dig that old tape out and, and get at the data. You're going to want that quicker. Uh, heterogeneous media types, kind of as I was saying before, you're now going to have maybe a mix of, um, you know, flash in there for your warmer or hot data, SAS, if, if getting any of that really anymore, or the SATA drives and tape. But you want to have it um, uh, really based on what your data retention or restoration is, is going to define where that data is going to go across that heterogeneous type. But your active archive is going to really encompass all those types, uh, potentially. And then lastly, of course, we're pretty much talking about unstructured type data here. And then baby, uh, basically some of the use cases that we're seeing customers use for active archives is kind of that first one I used on my first slide a few minutes ago, which is your, the web-based application kind of data or whatever your, maybe your enterprise's applications uh, is generating, whether, whatever it be, just basic data or files, photos, whatever. That's one uh, example. Digital media libraries for, um, you know, if you need to retain your uh, videos, retain and store videos, music files, or even audio files of any sort, definitely falls in there. And then the last one is the historical big data sets. I don't know if any of you guys were in the um, partner keynote a little while ago. Intel's mentioned their uh, estimate was, I think they threw out a number of like 50 billion internet enabled devices um, now and over the coming years. All that stuff is generating mounds and mounds of data and you're going to need to store it uh, somewhere. So those are the three main uses for active archives that we see today. Um, yeah, so then why are people now beginning to look at objects for these active archives, kind of blending these two topics now together to move forward with what we want to talk about today? So as I mentioned, you know, those, those file systems and the file-based approaches, when they get up to that scale, capacity, or number of files under management, uh, it really begins to be quite a burden. You don't want to be migrating between the different datas, uh, between the different levels, and the performance can really begin to suffer as that file system takes a while to kind of uh, search and, and find the files uh, that need to be accessed. Um, whereas an object-based uh, approach allows all the data to be instantly accessible, uh, unlike that tape layer that could take a little while to get it. You're going to have all that readily accessible via the object ID in the architecture. Um, thirdly, as that point I mentioned a, a minute ago, in terms of the different kind of data and restoration and retention types, that will dictate the kind of media you're going to put it on. So the uh, have more granular cost performance designs delivered that way. And then um, it's that extensible uh, metadata that's going to give you the um, ability to search and lifecycle management of the data over time. That is something that, as I mentioned earlier, Ceph has uh, from the very beginning. It's been an object store, so we'll be talking a little bit more about that in a few minutes as well. Okay, so I'll uh, turn it over to Neil to talk through the next section, really why Red Hat Ceph storage is a good fit for object storage. Sorry, I shouldn't fiddle with my... Uh microphone just as I'm about to speak. Um, so Steve has left me with the, uh, uh, the more salesy bit, which is unusual given he's in marketing, I'm in product management. But um, so I just want to explain a little bit about why Red Hat Ceph storage in particular is well suited for storing large, large data sets. <clears throat> uh, most of you are probably very familiar with Ceph uh, in the context of OpenStack. That's certainly one of its sort of breakout use cases, and uh, we have a large number of uh, happy customers running Ceph for OpenStack. But as Stephen mentioned, Ceph has actually sort of uh, been around as an object store system even longer than that, and we also have some very, very large customers running it, uh, perhaps less visible in the Ceph community and in the uh, sort of Ceph commercial world. But um, some of the largest deployments that we have, and some of the oldest, are actually running the object storage system. Uh, there's a lot of object storage options out there now. Uh, it's sort of, uh, you know, every week I read a new startup launching with some sort of uh, uh, object storage service. Um, but we still feel that Ceph is pretty unique. Um, and actually, its legacy and its history uh, puts in a very strong position when competing for these large active archive data sets where, you know, it's all about scale. Um, archives are implicitly large, and we feel we can address that. So there's a couple of reasons why we're, we're um, really trying to pr promote Ceph now as a much, uh, uh, you know, sort of um, multi-purpose system rather than just OpenStack and really accentuate the object side. Um, but some of it does overlap with OpenStack. The first one is, is going to be the scale side. So at its lowest level, 
Ceph is an object store. That's its entire architecture, which is called Rados, the thing that had 10 years worth of uh, R&D and peer review and community development is an object store system itself. So often analysts sort of get this confused that we do offer block services and even file now, uh, but they still sort of say, but you're an object store product. And yes, that's absolutely true. We're an object store product and an architecture. So Rados is a peer-to-peer uh, -peer system. And uh, we often flippantly say it's got more in common with something like BitTorrent than it does with maybe ONTAP or sort of a traditional storage operating system. And, but that's an important point because that is how it scales. This is how things now scale in, in, in the sort of uh, IT world is through distributed systems. And this is a distributed peer-to-peer -peer system. Every time you add more nodes, every time you add more storage, it's just another set of software processes talking to all of the other ones. And it's managed through a very, very elegant algorithm called Crush. And if we were into sort of intellectual property and so on, Crush would be the thing you would hoard and keep to yourself and put patents on. But it's actually obviously all open source. But Crush is the thing that really gives Ceph the intelligence to allow it to scale. Um, and also, importantly, to scale over multiple different types of storage media and allow you to have a very fine-grained policy and control over where your data goes. Crush is actually uh, used, um, I think even Twitter wrote a blog about this a couple of years ago, how they were using a Crush algorithm to handle all of their object storage, or blob storage as they call it. So every time you post a photo um, on Twitter, it gets put into object store. Crush, again, the algorithm there is managing where the data goes. So we have this very, very scalable le level, not just for the data, and this is critical when it comes to active archives, is for the metadata as well. So in the storage world, we often get obsessed around how much data can you store, how big a file, and so on and so forth, how many small files. But actually, specifically with active archives, the whole point of this uh, is that you know, you're infrequently accessing data, but it's over a very randomized set of data. You know, it's, it's, you've got all this data. Sometimes you'll be accessing this file, this file. You don't know. You can't predict it. And so the ability to, to know what you've got, to find it quickly, to perform operations on it is critical. And so we also store all of the metadata about these files down in the RADOS layer as well. So that means we additionally get the scale. And we also get very, very fast actual operations around that metadata too. So trying to see what you have. Maybe you want to just do an index of a bucket. Um, uh, so read an index of a bucket, sorry. Or you might want to delete lots of objects. We do that in a very distributed and efficient way as well. And it becomes really important as your system gets to multi-petabytes. So some of the competitors out there are very good at storing the data. But you go and sort of try and ask what data you have, and you can be sitting there for a week to find out. So some real, you know, real sort of um, uh, uh, uniqueness around that scale aspect with Ceph. Okay, we've, I'm storing all this data. I'm storing this, all of this metadata, but how do I get access to it? So we use something called the Rados Gateway, which is a very lightweight software process. Doesn't actually store any state. It literally is just a converter. It's a protocol converter, which will take a request through standard object APIs like S3 um, or Swift and allow you to read and write that data. Also allows you to do all sorts of other things. You can do object versioning. You can do lots of very sophisticated, fine-grained ACLs. Um, you can apply lots of arbitrary metadata, again, to go and search on. So these are the things which sort of uh, make Rados more web friendly for developers to interact with. And importantly, now you're seeing lots of applications, off the shelf applications, start to use S3 as their protocol. So if you've got media sort of post production tools or archiving tools, often those things will speak S3 as a, now as the sort of almost de facto object standard, and we'll support those pretty much um, out of the box. So a huge set of tools that you have access to, both in terms of sort of generation of content, manipulation of the content. Um, but also, this is about scaling in terms of access here. It's all very well being able to store all the data, but you also have to be able to get access to it. And because these things are very lightweight, you just add them as you need them. You can scale the amount of concurrent access that you have to your system just by plugging in more of these RGW nodes uh, on top of Rados. The third area, which is obviously critical, comes around cost. So if you're storing petabytes of data, as, as uh, Steve mentioned earlier, the traditional way was to do this on a NAS, on a sort of a filer. And these things are expensive. They're very big proprietary appliances. Um, when you want to scale the data, you have to add another one, decide what you're going to move around. Very bulky, but also very expensive. 
One of the beauties of software-defined storage, as hopefully you all know, is that you can pick your hardware platform. You can choose whether to use a Dell box or a Super Micro box or um, you know, whatever you choose. So that ability to really customize your hardware platform is critical because it is going to change. If you're going to pick an Active Archive platform, that, uh, uh, you know, that the hardware that you need will probably want to have refreshes every two to three years to take advantage of larger disks, different chassis. Maybe you want to bring in a faster tier. Having that flexibility to adapt to your customers' um, uh, data uh, requirements uh, in terms of access is going to be really, really important. It also just gives you a very simple economy of scale when you're trying to buy the same set of servers for your compute as well as for your storage. So you can go to your hardware vendor and hopefully get some, some advantages there. The other feature that um, is really critical and this really opened up the, um, the amount of opportunities around Ceph in, in the uh, archive space is around erasure coding, which is effectively a way of doing RAID, but instead of doing it just across individual disks and a single physical platform, you can do it across multiple machines spanning the network. So erasure coding is a, similar to RAID, you have parity bits which allow you to compute what's missing if you have failures or you lose data, as opposed to just keeping copies, which is sort of simpler to do, but has uh, a cost overhead. So with something like erasure coding, you can set um, uh, you know, the, roughly the value of one to 1.5 um, extra data, to, to, to keep the system robust um, and really drive down the TCO. That's very customizable. You can choose sort of fast recovery um, or you can choose faster sort of um, IO to the data. There are lots of algorithms you can use with erasure coding or sort of variables you can use with erasure coding to sort of change that, uh, that balance. But it really keeps the cost down and is a huge, huge advantage um, over traditional systems which perhaps just use replication or even basic RAID itself. And finally, of course, because I have to do the, the Red Hat uh, unique proposition, um, is the open source aspect. But this is actually really important when it comes to these large, large data archives. Um, vendor lock-in has become a little bit of a sort of a meaningless mantra because we've been saying it for 15 years and it gets lost in some of the, um, you know, the, the wash of open source trying to evangelize itself. But at heart, vendor lock-in is really about you know, mitigating vendor migration costs. When you have large amounts of data, that is a really big issue. Trying to move petabytes worth of data is one of the most you know, difficult challenges that I think IT faces right now. And it's so bad, it's coined its own term of data gravity, meaning that once you've put data somewhere, it's not going to move. It's very, very sticky. So actually ensuring that whatever platform you're choosing for your multi-petabytes of data, you can continue to use or adapt as you want to, despite you know, the relationship you have with your vendor or so on is absolutely critical. You buy yourself into a proprietary technology where you cannot move that data without serious operational cost, and that's a big problem. So actually, you know, this vendor lock-in mantra is perhaps even more relevant now than it used to be when, you come, when it comes to using uh, um, uh, object storage at large volumes. And of course, you still get all the other benefits of open source. It's very open uh, for development from the community. Um, and particularly with Ceph, we're very proud that actually a large number of vendors are now choosing to showcase their latest hardware with Ceph. So because we're an open source project, you have companies like Intel and Samsung, SanDisk, Toshiba coming to the Ceph project to say, I have latest version of both slow you know, slow media, and obviously also fast media with flash, and saying, I want to showcase it with Ceph. So we're actually starting to see a real sort of innovative pace of open source, um, which is outmatching the proprietary world because the vendors are show, you know, developing and optimizing their software with us first. So this is really exciting, and it's a real change for open source, which used to be just, you know, sort of commoditizing what was already there. We're now sort of actually getting up ahead of the curve and really showing the innovations specifically around media types which when it comes to these large systems can be really advantageous for, for you, the customer. Okay, that's the sales pitch. Um, just gonna go through some basic uh, best practices. Um, I'm not gonna go into all of the features that we have with Ceph. If, if you want to hear some of the new stuff that's um, just appeared in the, in the product we've just announced, I'll be covering that in a roadmap session tomorrow afternoon at the same time of 3.30, um, where in particular, we've now announcing global clusters. You can spread your cluster globally over 
multiple geographies and have it all sync up. Um, very powerful feature we've just introduced. But I wanted to go through some, some of the more common questions we get asked about when customers are looking at us for object storage um, in terms of, you know, uh, I'm, I'm, I've decided to use Ceph. It's great. I've, I've picked you as a platform, but here are some, some, some 101 questions I have. I thought I'd pick up on some of those. So the main one is hardware. Customers usually like to overload their machines with disks. I'm running lots and lots of uh, I'm storing lots of data. I'm going to put as many disks into a chassis as I can. I've found some Taiwanese company that produces a 120-slot single machine, and I'm going to put eight terabyte disks in there, and that means I can store lots of data. Uh, and it's like, well, no, because you're only going to have a couple of, you know, you have a couple of cores in there which have become overloaded very quickly. So hardware is the biggest issue which we really try and steer customers away from over over specifying. Um, the amount of storage they have on a chassis basis. So we have a wonderful team in a storage business unit led by somebody called Brent Compton, who is not in the room, otherwise I'd all point him out to you. And his team are fantastic. They're doing solution architectures and de designs with some of the major uh, hardware manufacturers. So roughly they've categorized, um, this is for all Ceph workloads, they've categorized that you either have an IOPS optimized configuration throughput or you're very sort of capacity optimized. Obviously, when it comes to active archives and large multi petabyte object storage deals, it's the cost and sort of capacity optimization that you want. And as you can see there, depending roughly where you're starting at, uh, we, we are still quite uh, bullish about, you know, 24, 36 disk chassis. Yes, you can go much deeper, and we're starting to qualify some of those 60 and 70 up chassis. But actually, even at a, at a, for a reasonable cost performance uh, mix, 36 is pretty good. Um, so strong recommendation to look at some of the solution sizing guides which we publish on the Red Hat storage webpage, which go into the specifics of this and how we've tested it and what tests we've done. Um, but don't just jump straight to the 60s. We're, you know, wait for us to publish some information. You'll see stuff coming out over the, uh, over the coming uh, months this summer. But a lot of customers, even very large systems running 24, 36 drive chassis on multi petabyte environments. Also, with the sizing guides, we also indicate sort of more general hardware um, uh, policies around the amount of memory, the amount of CPUs that you should have in a chassis, um, and some configuration settings as well. So you can see, obviously, as I've sort of called out earlier, you're running RGW, you're probably going to be doing more hard drive than flash. Um, sometimes you don't actually need any journals or flash at all. Um, you can, uh, you can co-locate journals, which we use for coalescing writes. You can co-locate those on the spindle, so you can really sort of rapidly drop your cost by getting rid of any of SSD. It's a single spindle machine. Um, obviously, you use erasure coding. That does have implications for the CPU, so you do need to be a little bit more um, sort of generous with the CPU that you give. So again, really, well, I, I haven't given any of the sort of the, I haven't shown you any of the greatness of the, these 40 page documents. I really encourage you to go and read those um, so you can sort of see the recommendations that we have. So in the emerging hardware that we're starting to look at, there's a lot out there. And I mentioned we have a lot of vendors coming to us going, we want to showcase this, that, and the other with, with Ceph. So um, do we have what we call all the industry starting to call JBOFs, just a bunch of flash. That is these super dense, all flash systems. And yes, you do actually get um, all flash active archives, uh, particularly for big data. We're really seeing customers want to store massive petabytes worth of big data sets um, to call out <clears throat> and to, put, to pull in sort of to, to Hadoop clusters to do the analytics and then they push it back out. But when they want it, they have to have it fast. So we're seeing very large high density flash multi-petabyte archives, and so we see some vendors working on that. Um, we also see on the ARM space a lot, of, a lot of interest here. We don't support ARM just yet. I think that hopefully will be coming next year. RHEL, I think, is soon going to announce full GA support for RHEL on ARM. Uh, I think, I'm not sure of the exact timing, but I know they're sort of working towards that. So we see ARM servers. Um, we also, more interestingly for us, we're seeing ARM drives, which are actually individual disk drives with an ARM chip on it, which can actually run the Ceph software natively on the chip. 
So this is slightly different to the key value drives or kinetic is the, probably the most uh, well-known one, where there is an ARM chip, but it doesn't actually run arbitrary software. It's just running a sort of a proprietary key value interface which you can hook into. But the ARM drives we're working on is actually Ceph gets loaded onto the system itself. So you can just buy these disks, plug them in, Ceph is already there, and you get this lovely distributed system. So we're very bullish on that. We're very bullish on the, um, the, the, the high density flash systems. But we're sort of keeping our eye open on all of this as a product perspective. The community's working to enable all of these. <clears throat> and the last one, which we do get asked about in the context of active archives, are SMR drives, which are these very, very high dense uh, magnetic media. And we're advising caution on those right now. They, they have a lot of question marks around their uh, robustness. Um, and so even though those offer the possibility of very dense magnetic storage, we're just saying to customers, don't, don't use those quite yet. We need to do, want to do a little bit more validation. So ARM drives and the high density flash arrays we're bullish on. The rest of the stuff, we're just going to urge some conservatism. So that's hardware. Um, so what about topology? Ah, that's interesting. That's rendered really badly in uh, PDF. This is the, the lesson of why you shouldn't convert from PowerPoint to PDF. Um, <clears throat> so what's missing in a box? I'll have to describe it now. Using, uh, so what it should say in a box at the top is uh, S3 client, <laughs> or the, the client accessing the, the, arc, uh, the, the system. And we often get asked a lot of questions around, uh, it's a, the box on the left is just a duplication of the one on the right, it's also HA proxy and RGW. We get a lot of questions around how do I manage access to the system? How do I load balance across it? Well, the first answer is yes, you should use a load balancer. This is almost a sort of a, a given now. RGW as a protocol converter can terminate the connection directly, but it's there to, and it's optimized to do the, the protocol work. It's not there to handle billions of concurrent connections, handle throttling, uh, uh, SSL, all these kind of things you really want to try and offload onto more specialized processes. So HA proxy is probably the most widely used software load balancer, and, but, uh, and that's very common. Uh, and we're very happy to support that. Hardware load balancers tend to be um, also fairly prevalent and we're, we, we encourage people to use those. If you are using a software um, uh, load balancer like HA Proxy, then you can co-locate it with the RGW um, to save some, uh, um, some cost on hardware, reduce your node count. Um, but as many of these as you want, um, and you know, the HA proxies will obviously balance across all the, all the RGWs. But this is definitely a better way to manage load, manage SSL, manage the security uh, than natively terminating on RGW. Let's see, OK. Uh, next up is, OK, once you've decided on your RGW layer, you've got the RADOS layer. And this is kind of common questions. You've got to think about what is the, uh, the hardware mix you want underneath that. <coughs> so. <clears throat> you will probably, if, unless you really, really don't care about read performance at all, <clears throat> once customers are accessing your data, you'll probably go for spindle everywhere. But you can tier. And <clears throat> RGW is very, very flexible in terms of where you put uh, or where you place your data. So you can set it up so some users will go to a fast pool. You can set it up so that um, you can offer almost like a bronze and, and gold plan. So you can you know, direct some, some users to the, to, to, to the fast tier. They pay more. Redirect them to the, to the, to the slow tier. They pay less. <clears throat> you can, the, it's really very flexible in terms of the API redirection. So you can, you can choose which data types. You may want to have all data. Say you know, large files go to, to one media, or small files go to another. So very, very configurable. And you've already got to think about what is the SLA and the cost that you want to offer um, back out to your customers. But above and beyond just actually picking the different tiers or the different media, uh, media types, you can also actually spit out the metadata. If you remember earlier on, I was saying that metadata scaling is almost as uh, a bigger challenge or important criteria as storing the actual data itself. So one of the cool things you can do with Ceph is actually say, look, all the metadata goes on the fast tier. <clears throat> or the flash or the SSD, um, and all of the actual data goes on, on the HDD. So again, you can get to do really fast lookups, very fast um, scans of an index uh, of a bucket, um, perform you know, updates to the metadata and so on uh, by hosting all of that on SSD, but actually keep the retrieval on a slow, slow disk if, if that's what you want. 
So getting this right, getting that blend of the hardware, understanding the performance and cost criteria is as, you know, the, the biggest, biggest sort of area to put time and effort into up front because you can modify afterwards, but again, once the data's on there, it takes time to move it. And finally, you know, one of the things that we customers uh, need to be <laughs> conscious of is we encourage you to store everything, but not necessarily indefinitely. You can set policies such as expiration to actually prune and delete things. So this is really critical if you've got something like rich media or content that you're licensed to, uh, to host. So we have companies who sort of ho hold video on demand, but they need to set an expiration so that it deletes when they, they lose their license to that data or, their, or the, the copyright to that, uh, to that data. Um, but similarly, you may have your own things where you may say, look, I don't want to keep everything forever, get rid of it after five years, three years, whatever it is. So you can do things like object expiration to really manage the data. So again, think about that, whether you want to set the default or leave it arbitrarily up to the user to help you uh, to manage the data growth. Okay, so those are some basic uh, best practices. And again, you can ask me some, some of the other um, configuration issues at the end on the Q&A. Um, <clears throat> just to close, um, I want to sort of give a little hint about some of the things that we're working on for uh, as part of the roadmap. I'm going to go into a lot more detail tomorrow covering all of the new things we've been working on uh, for the, the latest release of the product, Red Hat Ceph Storage 2, um, and uh, the one we're planning for, for, next, for next year already. But I wanted to give just a hint on some of the specific object features relevant to Active Archives. So the big one here is going to be around tiering. Um, tiering is, is uh, you know, um, uh, the concept of moving data as opposed to sort of caching data, which is where it stays in one place, but copies may spring up arbitrarily based on various policies. But what we're seeing is a uh, big demand for actually to, to really span archives across different environments and infrastructures. So it may be that um, the data is generated in a, in a public cloud but over time, you want it to be moved on-prem, or vice versa. It starts off on-premise, where you want to have tight security control and so on, but you may want to migrate some of those older data sets onto, say, something like AWS Glacier, um, or you may even want to um, archive it out to a tape. So uh, we're working on this tiering, function to, tiering functionality to be multi-purpose and really allow you to choose almost any arbitrary uh, system to move the data to. Um, and obviously, this can, this can work for just backup purposes or just sort of main, maintaining uh, the on-premise system for sort of the hottest data that you have. So tiering is going gonna, is gonna to be the, uh, one of the biggest features that we have on the biggest architectures. Um, the second one, again, this is the uh, diagrams kind of uh, <coughs> got corrupted in the transfer, but that's an RGW box on the top there, <coughs> is the ability to actually search on the metadata. So this is where, uh, so this is where um, you can obviously do um, primitive searches. You know, if you know what the metadata is and you know the object that you that you have, and say, you know, give me that, give me that this object, and that I can then go and post hoc see the metadata. But what we want to enable people to do is perhaps go and generate arbitrary searches in a sort of a, a SQL-like fashion to say, show me all photos taken by Steve on his Nikon between this date and that date. Or go through and say, show me all the PPT files um, which were created between this date and that date, uh, which came from this department. If you store that metadata, you can then go and construct these queries which allow you to go and decide what objects you want to pull out of the system. It will show you the list of objects. You don't have to know it up front. So this will actually um, be working probably with an external system, something like um, Elastic, to allow you to export all of that metadata into a third party tool to then go and uh, query it. One of the reasons that um, we feel we're going to have a good solution around this compared to some of our competitors is that Rados itself has incredibly extensible ways of generating and managing that metadata and the, the triggers to sort of generate new indexes on the fly. So we have a real way of keeping those, those indexes up to date. You don't have to go and do a trawl and export the information in big clumps. You can do it um, pretty much um, instantaneously from the Rados cluster. And finally, um, I had a great comment uh, turning, which is if you don't mention security, customers assume you don't have any. We have great security in the product already, but we're going to try and make it better. Um, we currently support um, at-rest encryption at the block level. That is, if you've got um, DM crypt on your system, we'll encrypt the actual disk drives and, 
uh, at the block level. But we also want to implement um, client and server side encryption using the Amazon style services where the user can choose on the object by object basis to encrypt uh, um, things, either using a key that they provide or a key that's managed um, through the encryption service itself. So this means that if you don't trust your admin to have enabled the at-rest encryption at the block level, you can choose to encrypt yourself at the client level. We're also looking to um, offer, and this may actually come out as a tech preview in one of our point releases over the next few months, the Amazon Secure Token Service, which is a Kerberos-like sort of ticket granting system which allows you to um, hook up uh, this system into uh, um, existing sort of Kerberos environments that you may have. The current version of the, the version of the product we're just about to release in a few weeks, we do support Active Directory and LDAP for the, for the user authentication. This will extend it out and really give us end-to-end -end encryption. And finally, um, we're hoping to have end-to-end -end encryption using just SSL through all of the endpoints. So at that point, we should have full at rest and on the wire encryption throughout the whole stack.